This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. Motorsports journalist, television personality, and founder of Speed51.com, Bob Dillner, on this edition of Conversations. Bob Dillner's career in motorsports journalism began in his teenage years when he started writing stories for a motorsports trade publication in the Northeast. He would go on to start his own television show and eventually work for Fox Sports and Speed Channel. Over the years, Dillner has covered major marquee racing events, from NASCAR's biggest event, the Daytona 500, to what many consider short track stock car racing's best, the Snowball Derby. Dillner is also the founder and president of Speed51.com, a digital platform covering short track racing. We welcome Bob Dillner to Conversations. Thanks for being here. Hey, nice to be here. Always love coming to Pensacola, Florida. It's a great place to hang your hat. It is, it is indeed. <laughs> Plenty to do. <laughs> it is indeed. What first got you interested in uh, motorsports? You know, my, my dad was involved in motorsports, and that's what you see a lot of uh, things happen. So he was a crazy figure eight race car driver, you okay. know, uh, where you hit in the X, and um, he didn't have a lot of money. Uh, so he, he basically hung up the helmet uh, early on, and, and he would give me a steering wheel. Uh, we'd go up into the grandstands, and he'd take his belt off and put me into one of those seat backs in, in the grandstands, buckle me in with his belt, give me a steering wheel, and I'd pretend I was my favorite race car driver going down the racetrack. <laughs> and so we spent, you know, time as family, um, you know, at different racetracks in the Northeast, uh, specifically on Long Island where I grew up. And uh, we just went to the racetrack every single weekend. Most people do stick and ball things right, right, on the right. weekends, and I, I love all sports. But we did racing, right. and, and I was kind of an oddball in that New York, Long Island scene because my my friends would say, "What are you doing? Going to the races? What right. the heck is that about?" Right. Uh, but uh, the passion was born from my dad, uh, who taught me the love of racing. You know, it, it's often thought of as you know stock car racing being kind of a southern thing, but there's some there's some great uh, legacy, particular journalists and sports announcers that came out of the Northeast, right, f covering stock car racing. Oh yeah, I mean big time. Dick Bergeron is one of them. Yeah. And, and Ken Squire. Yeah. Um, he, he's my idol. Yeah. Uh, the Dean of Motorsports Broadcasting, yeah. and he's taught me so many things throughout the years. Uh, I remember, honestly, you know, my first live race, yeah. Charlotte Motor Speedway, big stage, and I'm the pit reporter, and I had talked to Ken, he was the play-by-play -play guy, and, and I see Shauna Robinson, you know, just up in smoke and coming down pit road, and, you know, I was at one end, and I had to go to the other end, and, and I'm in mid-stride, just running down pit road. It's long pit road at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Yeah, yeah. And uh, all of a sudden, Ken Squire says, let's go down to Bob Diller and find out what's going on with Shona Robinson. <laughs> I'm in mid-stride. <laughs> and, and I know, I just, I got to talk. So yeah. out of breath and, and trying to keep on running to get down there, you know, I, I, you know, hit the report pretty decent. And he said, good job, kid. <laughs> and, and that, to me, was something special oh, yeah. because, you know, Ken Squire, who had called that 1979 Daytona 500, just told me I did a good job as yeah. a kid. He's one of those voices you identify immediately with the sport, almost like Keith Jackson in college football. It, it is, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, oh, Nelly from Keith yeah. Jackson, yep. you know, yeah. uh, to Ken Squire, the kid from Michigan. Yeah. You know, he would always have a way, um, you know, a dialect yep. that would really resonate with who was listening. And, and I was one of those kids that would listen to Ken Squire. And I never thought I was going to go into TV broadcasting or anything of the such. Right. So I didn't study him. Uh, but now you go back, and I'll even look at some of the things right now, and I'll say, man, that, that's a unique way that he delivered that in an impactful way to allow people to understand, you know, what he was trying to get across yeah. and what was special. Yeah. And, and I think he always said, you know, uh, with, with race car drivers, these are common men doing extraordinary things. Yeah. And I think we've lost a little bit of that, you know, yeah. in some of the way we deliver the broadcasting of motorsports around the globe. Yeah. The other one I was going to mention, too, I want to get a plug in because I think he does a great job from the Northeast is Alan Bestwick, right? Yeah, Bestwick does a great job. He does a great job. And he, he comes from the radio side. Yeah. So he didn't have that TV-esque, you know, appeal. Yeah. He came and, 
and he described colors and numbers and so yeah. forth because having that radio background um, you know he had to say that on MRN radio so to listen to him I, I think he is one of the best as well yeah. because he's very descriptive in his nature yeah. and I think that honestly helps with how people honestly uh, watch listen yeah. uh, to to broadcast yeah. uh, you know races these days I think they actually listen and then watch when they yeah. want to when they hear that elevation in the vocal tone or they just know something chaotic is going on yeah. on the racetrack What's the most difficult part of your job covering motorsports? You know, the funny thing is, it's it's not a difficult job. Um, I'm I'm lucky to do what I'm doing, and yeah. and I have a passion for it. So, I think you just need to learn what to say when, uh, because you know, as a journalist, not just a broadcaster, uh, you want to say the right thing, and you know, you can't embellish too much. Right. Um, you don't want to be dramatic at times in right. calling a race right. um, and be descriptive by nature, but you can't be wrong. Right. And I think, you know, there was a time down in Daytona, um, I think Kyle Larson was involved in uh, the old uh, Xfinity Bush series back then. Right. And at Daytona, there was a bad wreck, and, and part of his car went into the grandstands. And for six hours, we went live. And I had to be very careful about what I said because I didn't want to give any misinformation. Right. And that's very difficult to do at times, yeah. you know, because there's only a, a minimal amount of information that you have and you're hearing other things, but you don't want to report, you know, bad information. Yeah. So, um, you know, Erin Andrews and I kind of talked about that uh, the day after because she was there for her first Daytona 500. Mm -hmm. And she said, man, I watched you. We were watching you from the bar. Right. And, and and you were having to give that same repetitive information. Right. And she said, how was that? And, um, you know, we talked a little bit about that because that's stuff that she's not usually in that situation right. you know, around football. Right, right. But at the same time, you know, we can all learn from each other. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I learned from, you know, people like yourself or Aaron or whomever it may be, right. Dave Despain and Ken Squire. Yeah. You listen to them and see how they covered a certain something. Yeah. And then you take a little bit of what they did well, and you hope that you can do that same thing in what you do. Yeah. Despain was another good one. He oh, my a, gosh. Yeah, Dave Despain yeah. is something else. One of my favorite times, honestly, was Despain. Dave Argerbright, uh, who is an author as well as a broadcaster um, and a journalist, um, we went to in, in Wheatland, Missouri. We needed something to eat. There's not even a stoplight in Wheatland, Missouri. And we're <laughs> out there covering some stuff for Mav TV, and we found a barbecue hut. And when I say hut, I mean hut. It was like this little wooden thing. And we're like, okay, let's try it. And for two hours, Despain, Argerbright, and I we just sat around, you know, just, you know, shooting the bull and yeah. talking about different stories that we've, you know, you know, been involved with throughout yeah. our careers. And it was honestly something in the middle of it. I said, guys, man, I almost feel like we should have cameras around us yeah. because I think people would love to listen to these stories about these drivers and the teams and the, you know, how we did things back in the day. Yeah. And Chris Economaki was another one. He just knew how to do it. Yeah. And it's almost, I'm not, I'm not as good as those guys. Um, you know, I think I do a, a fairly decent job, but they were, they were pros. They were. And, uh, you know, I'm just a fan of the sport, and I yeah. hope that, you know, uh, that comes across on the screen. Yeah. What's the biggest story you've covered? Wow, uh, there's been a bunch. I mean, the, the most important one, I think, to me is probably uh, uh, Dale Earnhardt's win in the Daytona 500. Um, probably not the most important thing I did mm -hmm. but it really made me feel special yeah. and you know I, I know that that day growing up and having my dad involved um, I called my dad after interviewing Dale Earnhardt Sr. in Victory Lane and I got his voicemail and uh, you know, I, I said, hey, Dad, just want to let you know, I got to interview Dale Earnhardt Sr. in victory late after he won the Daytona 500. And, and, and you know, I left that voicemail. I didn't, I didn't know how important that was to him. And years go by, and, you know, now we all go to cell phones and not at the old-fashioned, you know, answering machine. And um, I said, uh, Dad, you still got your, your answer machine? He goes, yeah, I, I kept that. And I said, you know, I said, well, you're going to throw it out? He goes, no, it has, when you called me from Victory Lane at the Daytona 500 after you interviewed Dale Earnhardt Sr., I wasn't going to throw that away. And I'm like, 
that was just surprising to me because I, I didn't think dad would would keep something like that yeah. but i think that shows you you know the fans that we were and you know it was neat for me because i was a dale and Hart, uh senior fan I, I have a picture of me with my dad and my brother in lime rock connecticut and i was just starting out in tv okay. and i have a you know denim three hat on <laughs> you know to show you how old school <laughs> yeah, that yeah, is yeah, yeah. And, and uh you know, and then I got to interview him and, and, you know, just got to spend some time with him. And he was just a captivating person because he wasn't, you know, that vanilla guy, mm -hmm. that politically correct guy right. that we see these days. He had character and he showed it oftentimes with a lot of us right. uh, getting to know us around the TV business. I was going to ask you, you know, you, you certainly have this image of him in the media and what he was like and, you know, what fans perceive him. But what was he like just off to the side in the, in the motorhome lot or at the airport or whatever? A jokester, really? honestly. Yeah. You know, uh, he, he wasn't as serious as he was behind the wheel. You know, right. he was bad to the bone. He was the intimidator. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and you know, I remember I brought my daughter into a test at Charlotte Motor Speedway. And she was a big Jeff Gordon fan. You know, uh, she you would dress up in a Jeff Gordon cheerleader outfit for Halloween and so <laughs> forth. And she's now married and, you know, uh, has, a, has a daughter. Uh -huh. uh, but I remember her bringing, in, uh, bringing her into the pit area. And I got her introduced to Jeff Gordon. She thought it was great. And on the way out, I had a, uh, a 65 Chevy C10 pickup truck. I moved south from New York. And I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna resurrect this truck. So I started working on it. It was primer, had a, had a 327 out of 68 vet in it. <laughs> so I was proud because it was l loud and mean. And uh, I get her in the car and this is, you know, young and dumb, no seatbelts, right. okay? <laughs> so she's in there, you know, she's like four years old and um, a truck pulls up next to me. And I'm like, uh, I look over and it's Dale. And all he does is he goes, nice truck and has a, one of those big old Dale Earnhardt Sr. grins, wow. and he takes off. So we get out in front of the speedway, and, and there was a little bit of traffic there, and, and I'm not watching really, but I see somebody tailgating me, and I'm like, what the heck? You know, so I give a little brake check, right? You know, pretty stupid thing to do, <laughs> but I give a little brake check, and this truck pulls up next to me again, and, and it's Dale, and, and he just smiles and takes off, so I'm like, I take off after her, right? <laughs> and, and we turn down this road, Concord Farms Road in, in Concord, North Carolina. And, you know, we start to go a little bit fast. Yeah, yeah. And he's got a brand new pickup truck and I got a 65 Chevy. And he gets around the corners pretty well and there's an S and, and I kind of start to, you know, lose it a little bit. And, and my poor daughter, she, she hits her head, you know, oh, no. against the glass because I went a little bit quick into this corner. And I backed it down. I'm like, I'm sorry, sweetie. But at the same time, I was racing down country roads in North Carolina with Dale Earnhardt Sr. That's so funny. That's funny. You talk about Jeff Gordon. I mean, he and Gordon had a unique uh, relationship, or certainly it appears that way. And wow, did they elevate the sport. Yeah, they did. I, and I think it was perfect because just when NASCAR was really rising was when Jeff Gordon came to prominence. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got there about five years after he got to Cup. Um, but I got there right in the thick of things, you know, when still Dale Earnhardt Sr. was there, Dale Jarrett, Mark Martin, uh, all those guys really made it. And it was when, you know, we had to get up at like four o'clock in the morning to get to the racetrack by five, because by golly, if you didn't get to the racetrack by 5.30, there was gonna be a line several miles long at 6 a.m getting into New Hampshire Motor Speedway and Daytona and Talladega and all over the place. So, you know, Jeff Gordon was really important because I think he completed the entire swing. You know, you had, here's this good old boy from Kannapolis, North Carolina, that was tough as nails, right. Dale Earnhardt. And then you get this guy from, from Indiana, you know, and, uh, and originally from California. But, you know, you get Jeff Gordon in there and he, he looks like, you know, a model. And you get that charisma going between the two, that love-hate relationship. And I think it really worked to bring NASCAR to the level that it achieved yeah. because you had the Jeff Gordon, I like the young kid, the good-looking, clean, and well-spoken guy. Right. But then you got, you know, 
no offense, you got, you know, farmers and you got, you know, blue collar people mm -hmm. that just love Dale Earnhardt Sr. and hate Jeff Gordon yeah. because he's he's the rich kid, right? right? Which he really wasn't. Right, right. Um, but it was portrayed that way. Yeah. And and I think NASCAR took full advantage of it. Yep. And it brought NASCAR to that level uh, of NFL yeah. and MLB and so forth for a while there yeah. uh, before they started to lose touch a little bit. I want to talk about that in just a second, but also I think about some of those guys kind of on the on the perimeter, on the periphery of that. I mean, you had the Rusty Wallaces of the world, the Mark Martins and the Sterling Martins, some of those guys, and they were characters within themselves, you know, and, and it kind of added to that, that flavor with Earnhardt and Gordon. I don't see that as much anymore, do you? No, I don't, and I think NASCAR wants to rebuild that. Yeah. But that was, you know, that wasn't those guys making that. That was NASCAR making characters out of those guys. Yeah. You know, I mean, listen, you know, Mark Martin, five times a runner-up in the, the Cup Series, you know, the, the lovable loser, so to right, speak. Right. You know, but I look at all the races that he won, and he finished second in points. And, you know, if you think about that, that was better than the guy that finished third and fourth and fifth and 20th. Right. So, um, he, you know, he's deserving to be in the NASCAR Hall of Fame. Absolutely. And, and those guys, you know, Sterling Marlin, mm -hmm. you know, and, and Rick Wilson and all those guys, you know, I, listen, I, I remember back in the day because times are different, you know, Sterling yeah. Marlin, you know, he'd be, you know, in the tunnel at Martinsville Speedway uh, bumping into a girl and next thing you know this girl's writing a name and, and a number you know on a piece of paper and handing it to Sterling I don't know what happened after that but, but by golly he, he got her number so you know you don't see that anymore and, and you don't see um, the camaraderie honestly uh, things are different mm -hmm. but we have to evolve with that I think and, and NASCAR has got a unique opportunity um, to re-engage the people that I think they forgot about, and they know that they forgot about some of those people. You don't have the characters anymore, Tim Richmond and so forth. Yeah. They were wild. But I think you're gonna start to see some of those characters, Chase Elliott, Ryan Blaney. They're starting to become themselves after having to learn who to become right. to make a name for themselves. And we were talking about NASCAR. I mean, a huge rise and then the, kind of the financial crisis hit and that seemed to be sort of the triggering point for, for it, to, it to start falling off. Why do you think they have not been able to reaccelerate at this point? Well, I think, you know, from, from a Fox standpoint, uh, we were drilled that, you know, hey, we need to focus on the 18 to 25 demographic, you know, and I would always say, well, wh what about that 30, 40 plus? The people that really are passionate about, they'll always be there. And, you know, I think we lost them uh, or a good portion of them. And we didn't gain the 18 to 25 demographic like they thought we would. Yeah. And we would purposely do things, honestly, in how we delivered our messages for that. And, you know, those people went elsewhere. And, you know, then, you know, things started to change in the Sterling Marlins of the world and, and other people. And unfortunately, Dale Earnhardt Sr. passed away. Things started to change a little bit. And um, people went away. And, and uh, kind of a unique story. I'm down at East Bay Raceway Park a couple of years ago. And it was like, uh, like two or three years uh, from, removed from doing a full-time NASCAR broadcast. Spent 17 years there. And now I'm doing a lot of grassroots stuff mm -hmm. and dabbling around when they bring me back for certain things. But I'm enjoying the heck out of it. And I get out of my rental car at East Bay Raceway Park where I'm going to do a live show for Mav TV that night. And, and that's just across the coast in Florida, you know, from East Coast to West Coast, Daytona, the big track, big right. lights. And I'm over at East Bay. And I get out of my car and I start to walk away. And somebody says, Bob Dillner. So I look around as a TV guy, you know how it is. Yeah. You don't know who these people are, right, right. but you're like, hey, how you doing, yeah, you know? Yeah. And you're polite and see what they want to engage in conversation with you about. And he goes, I'll be damned. <laughs> you used to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that to me shows you, and we got to talking about it. He goes, I used to be a big NASCAR fan. He goes, I used to watch you all the time. Where you been? And I said, actually, I'm over on the short track side now. And he said, me too. He says, I go all over the South, and I go on all these little short tracks. He says, you know why? That's where real racing is now. Yeah. 
He says, honestly, you know, once Dale Earnhardt Sr. passed and the young kids, I didn't know anything about them. Right. So I think it's as broadcasters, we didn't do a good enough job at, at telling people who these new people were when the, when they, you know, the old guard, you know, right. you know, was replaced by the new guard. And that's our fault to some degree. We were pushed to do cer certain things certain ways, right. but it's ultimately our voice that's on there and we could have changed things a little bit as well. Brings me to speed51.com. How did that come about? <laughs> It came about because uh, originally I, I was working, you know, when I came down in 1997 to Charlotte. I, I literally, I got a call and uh, they said, hey, you need to come down tomorrow. Uh, we want to talk to you about a job. What? Uh, my wife's six months pregnant. And I uh, went down there, flew down, called in sick to the news station in New York. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, uh, you know, and went down there. They, they hired me and I moved down, you know, literally uh, three weeks later. And, um, you know, I worked for TNN for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And then TNN decided they're getting out of motorsports. Right. And I got laid off. Okay, I moved down with my family. I got two daughters. What am I going to do? Um, so I had some time on my hands. And before Speed Channel came along and hired me, I actually wound up starting Speed 51. And I was passionate about short track racing. And I remember sitting down with my brother, who's now part of the Dale Earnhardt Jr. download, and a buddy of mine, Jeremy, and I said, hey, I'm going to start this thing. Will you help me out a little bit? Yeah. And uh, they said, sure, Jeremy, so I'll write for you a little bit. And my brother was good with graphic design, so he kind of des designed the site for me. And that's how Speed 51 was born. And, and we would put up, like, you know, maybe one story every two days. Uh, and to see where it's grown now is just unbelievable with the, the volume of information and stories and content that we're putting on there. But that's really how it began. It was, it was three people at a restaurant. And, um, you know, we talked and I said, hey, I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to create a site. Why are you going to do that? Well, this internet thing seems to be building, right? <laughs> so, it might take off. <laughs> yeah, who knows? But let's get out ahead of the curve. Let's put something on there. And, and that's what we did. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And well, you just really leaned into the whole thing. I mean, you, it was almost like you're on a wave, right? I mean, yeah. Because technology just. A little bit was luck. I mean, we started at the right time. Right. You know, I'm not that smart. You know, we, we just got lucky that we started back in 2001 when the internet, the only th other thing out there was J-Ski. Yeah. And J-Ski really covered NASCAR. Nobody was covering short track racing. Right. So we got in at the right time and started out as a hobby. And, you know, a few years later, we're like, okay, let's keep on going with this. And it wasn't until, you know, my wife in, in uh, 2009, she said, do you realize how much money we're spending out of our personal money for this? You know, and, and we were not, you know, Speed 51 was not profitable at all. And uh, she said, we need to turn this around a little bit to yeah. stop costing us our money. At least if we can break even, we can say, hey, we're building on something. Right. And that's what we did, honestly. Uh, we started to talk to people about advertising. We started to, you know, manipulate things in terms of uh, learning how to be marketable. Mm -hmm. And we turned it into a business. And the readership went up, and then we went to the video and the broadcasting and the on-demand video and created a network. And, um, you know, now it's the leading short track race, racing website in the country. And we have conversations with NASCAR all the time and, and um, you know, different uh, series and, and racetracks and events across America. And you just recently have a new ownership structure, as I understand it, correct? Yeah. So, uh, you know, the uh, major owners of the NASCAR Cup Series teams, uh, they wanted to invest in short track racing. They realized the disconnect, honestly, mm -hmm. between the grassroots fan mm -hmm. and where NASCAR is right now. And they wanted to do their part. Uh, so the, the big dogs, uh, you know, Mr. Hendrick and Roush and Ganassi and Penske and Gibbs and uh, to some of the smaller teams as well, like LFR and Go Fast Racing. Uh, they're part of Speed 51 right now. We have meetings with them every month. Uh, they're energetic. Joe Gibbs is, is, is like a little kid in the candy store. What are we going to do next? You know, and so, you know, we're coming to events and we're trying to make events bigger like the Snowball Derby and uh, many other events. We're, we're bringing a track back to life next year that's been dormant for seven years. Gresham Motorsports Park in Georgia, oh, wow. north of Atlanta. And, you know, we're doing it because we want to show people that we care. These people are not just about business mm -hmm. and making money. They know the health of the sport 
is derivative of, uh, behind the health of short track racing, right. where it all begins, where the stars are born. That's right. And uh, that's what we're here to do. Talk a little bit about the Snowball Derby. Snowball Derby is awesome. Gary Cinemont, um, who has won the Derby a couple of times, it was 2001, he said, Bob, you gotta come to the Derby with me. And I was covering ASA as well as NASCAR that year for, for TNN. Okay. And he said, uh, hey, you gotta come down to the Derby. So my brother and I literally on a Wednesday said, let's go. We drive down to, to the Derby, down to Pensacola, don't know what we're in store for. And we had started Speed 51 and literally um, get there for qualifying. I was like, whoa, look at these people. Yeah. And I went through the weekend and we're on the tower, the tower that you still see now at Five Flag Speedway. And in the middle of the race, um, I said to my brother, I said, we should probably cover this. We do have Speed 51, let's, let's do something. Yeah. And, and we did. And, and that's where, you know, um, you know, Speed 51 began with the Snowball Derby. And now we're the official media partner and we do the live broadcast. And uh, 2001, just two dudes up on top of the roof at Five Flags Speedway, freezing our butts off. And uh, <laughs> that's where it was all born for us. Well, you know, it's amazing the history of that race uh, over 50 some odd years and some of the stars that have come through there. I mean, the Waltrips and the Wallace. And yeah, it's guys. incredible. I mean, listen, the, the, the list of stories from there is incredible. Sockets in the pockets. Yeah. You know, when Stephen Wallace knew he wasn't going to make weight, the uh, son of Rusty Wallace, yeah. <laughs> and he, he put sockets in his pockets to weigh himself down and, <laughs> and get the weight of the car or the way the way he needed it to yeah. pass tech, and they caught him with the sockets <laughs> in the pockets. And, and uh, you know, just different stories that come out of there. Dickie but, Davis, from the, in the, you hear the story about him freezing the fuel. Yes. I mean, <laughs> yes. It, I mean it, it's incredible stuff. what people yeah. would do. Yeah. Um, but I think what's more impressive is n not just the, the winners, but the people that didn't win. Uh, yeah. You know, Rusty Wallace, it bothers him. I was doing a banquet where I was doing some guest speaking and he was gonna be up after me. And I just came off the Snowball Derby and they introduced me that way. And I, I'm, I'm in you know, some city around America. And so I get up there and I say, oh, yep, Rusty Wallace. I was just down to that Snowball Derby and by the way, your son won that race and you didn't. And you could see the steam coming out of his ears. I bet, I bet. <laughs> Bob, what a real pleasure. It was awesome. Great talking to you. Yeah. People can find you, speed51.com, and where else? Yeah, and Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter. Okay. So at Bob Dilner with two L's. Um, I like to talk to people. I like to know what they want to know and uh, just to converse with them. So I'm very active on Twitter. Not as much. I'm a little bit more private on Instagram and Facebook. Hard to find me there. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, definitely get a hold of me on Twitter. Awesome, speed51.com, and I'm sure we'll see you years to come at the Snowball Derby. Absolutely, it's a bucket list, and uh, I'll always be down here in the Panhandle of Florida. You bet, my friend. All the best to you. Thank you very much. Take great care. You Bob Dillner, motorsports journalist, television personality, founder and president of speed51.com. By the way, you can see more of our conversations online at wsre.org slash conversations. We're also flying around YouTube. I'm Jeff Weeks. Thank you so very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the broadcast. Take wonderful care of yourself, and we'll see you soon.